Alrighty guys, uh, good morning. Uh, thanks for being here today. Uh, you're in the talk, Computer Vision Made Easy from Pre-Trained Models to Custom Vision, Microsoft Cognitive Services has you covered, which is a mouthful, and if you're not in the right place, now is the time that you can leave, and it's still really polite. So I'm Anna Roth. I work on the Microsoft Cognitive Services team. Uh, I've been on the team for two years, and I work in the Computer Vision Services side of the team. Uh, today's talk is going to go through a lot of things. Um, the sort of real goal here is that there are a lot of different tools that Microsoft has made available, that we've announced, that we've talked about, and it can be very hard to wrap your head around. And so the goal here is to kind of take all of these various tools and say, if I have problem X, what is the right tool to do Y? Um, we won't be able to go in kind of exacting depth in any given tool, but I will call out when there are sessions about other tools, and there's a session about basically every single thing. Um, so if you want to get more information, there is kind of a place to go into more depth. Um, we'll go into a little bit of extra time on the custom vision service. One, because I worked on it. Two, because it's in the title. And three, because it's brand new. And I think it's something we have that's very, very exciting um, here at Cognitive Services. Uh, for background, um, oh, there. So for background, um, for those of you who are not particularly familiar with Microsoft Cognitive Services, uh, this is an offering we've had under the Microsoft Cognitive Services branding for about a year, and I guess two years for some of the original technologies. Um, it's a collection of tools, and the idea for all of these tools is they are very, very easy to use. Uh, historically, most of them have been kind of really general models. So it's you know image recognition and kind of general classes, or it's general speech to text. Um, and they're all kind of in the area of machine intelligence. Um, so you have vision, speech, language, knowledge, and search. Uh, and as of yesterday, also lab. So this is where we have now kind of the really early APIs, things that we're still kind of experimenting on, things that might change dramatically, um, or that we're still trying to figure out, you know, what is the way that that is something you know, people want to use in the real world. Uh, it's kind of like an early preview type feature. I'm even be showing off one of the really cool labs API or SDKs later today. Um, but broadly, you know, the goal is let's take research that Microsoft has done in machine intelligence and expose it to developers, make it super, super easy to consume. So for the most part, they're all cloud services. They're available on Azure. They're free to try. The goal is that they're very, very easy to get started. Um, you know, they're straightforward REST APIs. And the real idea here and kind of our thesis in building the cognitive services is that there's a lot of techniques and a lot of tools that you should be able to kind of get essentially for free, right? Like, if you want to just find faces in a picture or like get speech to text, that shouldn't require extra work on your behalf. Like, those are solved problems, and we should be able to just give you access to that in a way that is super trivial, so you can go on and build the app that your business needs. Um, there are now 29 APIs, uh, obviously. I will not even be going through all of these, uh, not even in great depth on all the vision tools. They're super, super cool. Um, obviously, that's a lot. Um, if you're trying to kind of figure out where do I get started with cognitive services, what do I do, there's all of this stuff. Um, I would suggest going to the cognitive services website. Um, one of the things that we've tried to do for every single API is build these like really cool little mini demos where you can actually like test out the services on your own data. Um, and so I do that all the time, but it's kind of a very, very easy way to get started. And then kind of broadly, Talk about why cognitive services. So we were talking about, we were talking about the first thing, right? Easy to use, REST APIs, or you know, beautifully designed SDKs, as we'll see later today. Um, straightforward, should be able to add it in a couple lines of code. Second is they're flexible by virtue of being um, cloud services for the most part. They're cross-platform uh, and they're tested. So you know, it's worth noting that Microsoft has been working on machine intelligence, artificial intelligence for 25 years now. I guess it's now year 26 of MSR. Um, and these are technologies that are not only shown within you know, cognitive services, but these are things that actually, these core technologies are in a ton of different Microsoft applications. So you have you know, the same team that worked on some of the same kind of speech to text work shows up not just in the cognitive services, but it you know, helps power Cortana or it helps power Xbox. You know, similarly, the same team that worked on the initial face models for cognitive services also worked on Windows Hello. So you have core technologies that are super tested, and our real goal here is that you know, while it can be kind of a pain to try to build this stuff on your own, because it requires often a lot of data, a lot of time to train, uh, the compute is like non-trivial, or you can buy your own GPUs, which is expensive. Um, we've taken things that are tested that we've used in our own technologies and made them accessible to you. Um, so, onto the tools. Uh, it looks like a lot. I was encouraged to come up with some funny puns around beehives. 
I didn't do that. But if you come for one after the talk, I'll give you like 10 points um, and shake your hand. Um, but yeah, so there are a lot of tools that we have here for computer vision. And to be very clear, you know, this isn't everything that you can do with computer vision from Microsoft or from Windows, obviously. So there's you know, plenty of stuff. On the Windows side, we're not talking about mixed reality. We're not talking about all that HoloLens business. There's a lot. Uh, where this talk is kind of scoped to cognitive services plus plus, a couple things that are related. So there are tools for building your own applications that have computer vision components um, that are you know, sort of straightforward and easy to use and that come primarily from the cloud enterprise division or from our AIR division uh, where I work. So I'm going to kind of walk through tool by tool. Uh, I have baked in plenty of time for questions. Um, basically, when I sort of transition from slide to slide, feel free to stand up. There's two microphones here. Um, I'll probably get to, I'll sort of gesture to you when I you know, have a natural pause. Um, but there is plenty of time for questions. So feel free to kind of ask them throughout. If not, we'll bake in some time at the end to kind of do all of questions. So let's get started with our first set of kind of four tools. Um, so these are the oldest, uh, but you know, certainly among the most exciting tools that we have. So there are the standard cognitive services, Emotion API, Face API, Computer Vision API, and Bing Image API. Um, just to so kind of get a sense, how many people in the room are already familiar with these? So most, but not everybody. So we'll take a little time to kind of go through them. Um, these are four core cognitive services APIs, all REST APIs. Um, they all take an image as an input. Actually, the Bing Image API takes either a query or an image, but the part that we're going to focus on today is the part that takes in an image as an input. Um, and they give you some piece of knowledge or information about those images. Uh, we'll start off with the fun, exciting demo that gives you a sense of what Face API can do. Okay, and stage lighting always makes me look really old, so I am not as old as this app says, and we can talk about why that happens. Um, so this is a nice example of our face API. Getting my face, yes. Okay, um, so what you can see here is that you're getting, uh, you're detecting my face, uh, you're getting an estimate about my age, uh, my gender, and my expression. Um, the camera angle is a little odd here, but you can see I can do something like smile. And it should get that I'm happy, or like, I kind of scowl. Should we get in contempt? I've gotten really used to doing that face. Um, we're getting some kind of basic information about the face. And we're actually running this off of a cloud service right now. So we're making API calls. You're seeing this kind of live. Um, you're also getting a sense of one thing that it doesn't do well, which is that today we get mostly kind of frontal or near side faces. Um, you know, we're working on kind of improving the profile detection. Um, but for now, you're getting kind of the best results facing front. Um, or kind of near frontal. Um, that's obviously kind of a big investment area. You get biological age. Um, sorry, not biological age. You get uh, visual age. Uh, biological age would be really hard. Uh, so <laughs> uh, what is that? Um, so basically, as you probably are familiar, you know, these kinds of classifiers are built on having lots and lots of humans label data. So we've had people go and say, look at you know thousands and hundreds of thousands of photos and say, how old does this person look? I'm going to move this back. Maybe. Uh, how old does this person look? And so there's some variation in that, right? Like it turns out if you give people a photo of the same person, um, we see cases where there's as much as like a 15 year difference. Like someone will say like, that dude looks like he's like, you know, about 30 and someone else is like, no, 45. Um, but generally, kind of within a five-year range, uh, you should be able to um, get kind of an age estimation, a gender estimation. And so we see customers using that for a lot of things. So for example, uh, Uber is currently using it for a rider safety feature, where uh, they want to verify that the person who signed up to drive is the same person who's currently driving you. So we're extremely delighted to have them as a customer. Um, and then lots of other customers using it for all kinds of analytics tools or kind of second factor authentication type scenarios. Um, and the reason that they can do that is that there's a thing called face identification. So what you saw right now is just face detection, so finding kind of my face in the box, making a few inferences about my age and gender and emotion. Um, in addition to that, you can also train it to recognize particular people. So I can say, given you know a couple photographs of Anna Roth and a couple photographs of some of her friends, is this photo of a particular person? There's verification, so are these two photos the same person? Uh, there's similar face searching, so if you don't know who the people are, but you have a set of faces and you want to say, find all the ones that are similar, face grouping, so I have a bunch of photos, like a family photo album, and I want to say, these are all the photos of one person, these seem like they're all photos of another person. 
these seem like they're all photos of a third person. You can kind of do all of that through Face API. One of the cool things that we have now at Build um, is that we've raised the limit on face groups from 1,000 persons to 10,000 persons, which is our number one request. So we're happy to have that here today to be able to talk about. But basically, it used to be the case that you could only train 1,000 people in your group to check against. Now you get 10,000. Um, so that locks, unlocks a lot of scenarios for folks. Um, and let's actually take a look at face identification. And I'm going to do this via this demo application. Um, obviously, I could have done this all programmatically. Uh, but I'm going to add a person and show you how neat this is. So let's add a person. Let's add me. And now this is going to be really awkward, but I have a bunch of selfies on my computer so that I can do this demo. But I promise that I don't just spend literally all day at work taking selfies, especially if my boss is watching. These were uh, for work, please. So let me grab, I'm going to start off with just one picture, and we'll see how we do with one. Ideally, you want kind of three to five. Um, but let's start with the one picture. Try to get a Roth. I got one face, and let's try training with one face and see if we recognize me. It might take a minute for this to, to start. If not, we'll have to do a couple more. Uh, not yet. Oh, there we go. So already with one image, uh, you can see there, there's my name uh, on top of the image. That's because we're already able to recognize uh, me. And that's how kind of quickly you can start uh, using something as neat as face recognition um, in kind of a trivial amount of time and effort. Uh, the other kind of note is this whole intelligent kiosk demo that we're showing here is on GitHub. So if you want to kind of start, play with it, do your own work, it's very, very easy to be able to uh, start working with cognitive services using this tool. I'm going to show one more demo here. So you've seen face, you've seen emotion. Um, so previously we had a distinct emotion API that's still up there. Um, but we now have added the emotion component to face, which was like a big customer request. We did that about a month and a half ago. Um, so now you only have to do kind of one detection if you want age, gender, and emotion. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is a feature of the Bing Image API. So the Bing Image API, very cool. Lets you do things that are probably obvious to you, like search for images. Um, but there's a, a super neat feature that a lot of people are not particularly familiar with that I want to call out, which is the similar image search feature. And when I saw this, I thought it was like completely bananas amazing. Um, so let's start off with just kind of a random demo image. So I got this swimmer dude, which we use for a lot of demos. And what you see, so this is our input image here on the right. And then on the left, um, you see images we've gotten from Bing that are visually similar. So what's neat here is it's not based on kind of the keywords that you're using or any extraneous information about the image. You're doing a similar image search here based on actual image similarity. So if we find, let's grab a different, get a photo like this with the skater here. Same thing, these are kind of visually similar images. And we can take one more where we'll actually, let's search for a, Skater. Maybe I want images that look more like this. Once again, we're doing an image search for visually similar images. So even though like these are both photos of skaters, what you see here are things that where the actual underlying properties of the image are relatively similar to the original image. Uh, so you can do this for products. Um, you want to kind of enable product search. Uh, we have people trying it out for things like design. So maybe like you're an architect or a design firm, and you say, I want stuff that looks like my picture here. Like, what other inspiration can I find on the web? All of that is available. Um, so that's the Bing visual search um, component of the Bing image search API. So next, we have the computer vision API. So OK. So this is perhaps what you might expect, having seen the other APIs, a tool for doing, for being able to take an image and get a number of properties of the image. Um, so you can see here, for example, you get this photo of a swimmer. Um, and you get some really neat things. The first and kind of probably the most impressive here is the caption. So you have a man in a pool of water. Um, 
see that right here. Or a man swimming in a pool of water. This is bananas neat to me. Um, I find this tremendously exciting. So what we did here is we had folks working in the area of computer vision and folks working in the area of natural language processing work together to build a model that could take an arbitrary image and generate a caption just from the contents of the image. So knowing kind of no other information of the image, you can get a natural language caption of that image. Um, so that actually is now currently featured in the Office Insider's version of PowerPoint. So we'll automatically generate alt text for images. So it's a way to make uh, PowerPoint presentations more accessible because rather than having to like caption every image, which I have to say I have not always done, but I know that I should, uh, you know, if someone's in a hurry, um, that actually is kind of added for you automatically. I think that is kind of a very beautiful example of how you can apply this kind of technology to make people's lives measure measurably better. Um, you also get tags here. So if you see here, we generate tags and confidence like water, swimming, sport, pool, and then a confidence score for each of these. Um, some other properties that are useful, uh, for example, whether or not an image is adult or racy. Um, you get the faces, ages, and genders in this image. So if you just kind of want the kind of basic face detection, you're getting that. And then some visual properties of the image, like the colors uh, that are dominant and accent colors in this image. Um, so examples of what we have people doing with this would be things like analyzing images that come off of so social media profiles. So you want to say, like, when people tweet at my company, like, what are the pictures in those profiles? What are the ages and genders of people in the images uh, that they're tweeting at my company? Um, you can kind of automate that analysis. Um, and we actually have uh, some delightful customers doing that today. Um, this is super cool, but customers sometimes run into a problem, which is we have 2,000 categories. And sometimes people want their 2,001th. Oh, before we talk about that, USQL. Sorry about that. Um, I swapped the order of these slides. Um, so one question that we often get from people is, you know, the cognitive services are great. Uh, it's nice that the API calls are really simple. The REST API calls, I can do it in my sleep. Very straightforward, but I have a lot of pictures. Um, you know, maybe petabytes of pictures. Uh, it might not be particularly convenient to have to actually go up and do every single picture individually particularly you like, already have them stored somewhere. So one of the things that we're trying to do with cognitive services now is take uh, those core models and export them to different Azure data engines. So we've already announced uh, an integration with Azure Data Lake and USQL. Um, so you probably saw, you saw a little snippet of this in the keynote, where if you have you know, petabytes of data stored in Azure Data Lake, you can run our core existing, some of the core existing models, like face and emotion detection, uh, the computer, a uh, computer vision API, uh, landmark, and tagging. Um, features uh, and kind of get that in a massively parallelized fashion and you're actually using kind of the familiar interface of SQL. Um, so it's quite neat. It's going back and forth is... Um, so you can take a look here at kind of what, uh, what these queries look like. And you can see in these examples, for example, like if you want to extract emotion from human, human faces, this is a code snippet that looks like SQL to me um, that you can use to, in a very, very short amount of time, and we're talking on the order of mil minutes for millions and millions of images, get uh, the emotion from all the human faces uh, in the images stored in your Azure Data Lake. And so in this way, you know, if the one by one thing isn't working for you, this gives you a way to you take advantage of the massive parallelization of USQL and Azure Data Lake to get results much, much faster, um, and particularly pleasantly through that very, very familiar interface. So that's USQL. Um, there is a USQL session later today, um, in particular about cognitive services and USQL. I will put all the related sessions on the final slide, um, but for those of you who think that this might be a good solution for your problem, let's take a look there. Now we can talk about custom vision. So the core APIs, super cool, very useful for a lot of people. But one of the things that customers have come to us to say again and again is, this is really neat, but it doesn't solve my problem because I have to recognize x, where x is the widget that their factory produces, or x is the categories that exist on their current website, or x is something specific to their country or their culture or their domain. Um, you know, computer vision API tagger today can recognize about 2,000 different kind of 
very general categories. Um, two years ago, it could do 86. You can see we've jumped a bunch since then. Um, but those 2,000 categories aren't every single category that every single person cares about. And so one of the big things that we're announcing this year at Build, and we kind of shut off a little bit in the keynote yesterday, uh, is the custom vision, uh, is this custom vision service. So first of all, I'm going to pause for a second and encourage all of you with computers to go to customvision.ai and sign up. Because if I get one thing out of this talk, it's that I want all of you to actually try signing up. And if you don't have a computer here, get out your phone, take a little note, or email yourself, uh, because I'm going to pause for like 15 to 20 seconds until folks do that, because it is this cool. Uh, you'll sign up with your um, MSA, so your like Outlook account or your live.com or Hotmail account. I see some computers. I see that guy typing over there. It's good. I promise it's worth it. Some of you may end up on the wait list because I think we're very, very close to our first quota, but we'll be bumping that up shortly. All right, this guy got waitlisted. Bad news bears. Very co-op. Um, we'll be bumping that quote up shortly. So those of you who are already on the wait list will hopefully get added soon. So what is custom vision? So this is a service for building image classifiers. Um, but the real goal that we have here is it should take you on the order of 10 minutes to be able to build out your classifier, um, plus or minus you know, the latency of uploading your images, depending on like, is your internet as good as ours? Um, but our, our goal here is it's about 10 minutes to get started. And in particular, the reason that we set this as a core goal for our team is that we had a vision for how you would actually build and improve classifiers. So the idea was that you want to do so iteratively. You want to start prototyping, be able to immediately start working with your classifier, immediately start sending images to that endpoint, and you know, actually be able to kind of test out your classifier in real time. And this is sort of inspired with working with real customers, where they would come to us and they would say, like, I'm ready for big data. I have all these pictures. I want to build a classifier to recognize like my company's X. And we would get there and we'd say, OK, that's great. Um, and you look at the images that they have, and they would be like glossy marketing images. So it would be like, I want to recognize my company's soda cans, or I want to recognize my company's you know, widgets in our factory. And they'd have a couple dozen images, and every single image would be like beautifully shot, lovely marketing images. Somebody has already like Photoshopped that widget. Um, but that turns out not to actually work very well. You know, when we're building an image classifier, you want the images that you've trained on to be as similar in underlying properties as the images that you're going to encounter in the real world. So having, you know, people thought, oh, if I have these like really clear, really you know, visible images, it'll be obvious, and the thing will learn better, and it'll be great. It's not quite what you want. What you actually want are images that are similar to what you're going to see, that are very diverse, so different lighting, different angles, different backgrounds, et cetera. And I know that I'm saying that as I have, you know, 50 pictures of ferns and pines in front of the same background. Um, person on our team who went to the park to take these photos missed the memo. Um, but you want really diverse images. Um, so I can show you, for example, I took an a set of images in our, let's see if I have it here. Um, so I spent a couple hours the day before Christmas taking photos of different soda cans that we've got. And these are the kind of pictures that I took. Uh, these are not glossy marketing shots. You're never going to see this in a Coke ad. Um, and this is one of like 600 different pictures that I took. Um, but what we needed here was photos that were in different backgrounds, different lighting, different situations, et cetera. Because we wanted to build a classifier that would be robust to the actual conditions that we wanted to use it in. Um, that's not super obvious to people when they first get started. And so. This idea that we had is, let's let people build their classifiers iteratively. There's some mistakes that you're probably just going to make when you start building it out. Or maybe you just don't have the right data. We should enable you to start building fast and make it better over time. So what we do here, which is really neat, um, is that you actually only need on the order of 50 images per category to start building your classifier. Um, so rather than needing like thousands and thousands of images, as you might need with like kind of some other traditional techniques, you're looking at 30 to 50 images. Like You all can take 30 to 50 images of whatever you're trying to classify. The next really neat thing is that training time is really fast. Um, so if I was to go and hit train here, I would expect that I would be able to train within one to two minutes. Um, super, super quick. 
enables you to once again sort of interact with this in an iterative way. And the third thing, which we're the most proud of, is this active learning component. Um, so at the end of training your classifier, you have an endpoint. I'm about to show my keys. Please don't use them right now. I will be changing these after this presentation. But uh, if you script the rest of this demo, I'm going to frown a lot. Um, what you can see here is calling the API is like very straightforward. Uh, once again, REST API. So your model is deployed to an endpoint for you. So we're hosting your model. So you're just sending an image up to the model uh, very, very quickly. And the neat thing is that every image that is sent to your endpoint is saved here in this predictions tab. Um, so you get the image, and then you actually get the, the actual prediction. So I think with relatively high confidence, we thought this was a fern. And I don't really know plants, but we get this one wrong because this is actually a Japanese maple, and we're calling it a rhododendron, which I definitely know it is not. Um, so you might be thinking, oh my god, like why is she showing me these things that are like not that correct? What we're actually doing here is ranking these in an intelligent way. So ranked near the top, we're going to have two factors that are important. So one is sort of recency. So if the image has come in relatively recently, our sense is there's a good chance like it's what you've been testing or it's what your users are actually doing. And the second is that we're using uh, a sort of more complicated entropy measure. So the idea is we want to rank near the top things that we're not super sure about. Because if you as a human are going to spend some time like actually labeling your images, there's no point in labeling something if we're like 99.9% .9 sure that it's a fern. Like we know it's a fern, you know it's a fern. It's not worth doing. It's not worth your time. So what we've done here is ranked it. Um, and there's this, I was saying, there's this suggested, uh, you can see it right here, there's this suggested tab here for kind of sorting order. We're ranking this here in the order that you should be labeling, or that we kind of have made an estimate that, uh, that you ought to be labeling to kind of minimize the time that you spend. Um, and right now you see the duplicates, that's something that we'll eventually, eventually kind of also do some dedupes. Uh, so I can go through and say, okay, this, it's a fern. It's nothing else. It's not a Japanese snowball. So let's say yes. Um, this is a Japanese maple. So I've labeled some images. Now, how cool is this? I'm just going to go and hit train again. And in one to two minutes, I should have an updated classifier, something that is now taking into consideration uh, that additional data that I've already provided it. Um, and so this kind of active learning style of sorting is one of many things that we have done to build into this application kind of heuristics or ideas or rules that we came up with building other image classifiers. So actually, two of our researchers that worked on this project are sitting right here in the front row. Uh, Lei and Yishao, you should wave. Uh, poor Lei and Yishao spent an ungodly amount of time getting the uh, new computer vision landmark detection classifier working. It's amazing. You should check it out. Many of the things that they learned actually building out uh, the, might be a little slow here because we're running on our PPE version. Oh, it's done. Um, so many of the things that they actually kind of learned or figured out working on many of the cognitive services computer vision components, but in particular the landmark classifier recently, we've actually kind of built in that knowledge and those heuristics into this application. So you know, kind of this active learning style um, is kind of directly inspired by the work that Yusho had to do to make uh, the landmark classifier work a little better. And the, um, there's a bunch of other stuff that we do on the back end that's sort of hidden. So like it's sort of non-obvious to you. But for example, you know, if I upload a photo of my cousin or a Lamborghini or a cupcake to my leaf classifier, you know, your expectation is probably that that is not classified as a leaf. That's actually non-trivial to do. So there's plenty of stuff that we do on the back end. So despite you only uploading a couple hundreds of images, we're handling thousands of images on the back end uh, to kind of improve your training set, make sure that you're actually kind of getting good results. So all that kind of like arcane computer vision knowledge that require PhDs and fancy people to do. We're trying our best to actually build into this for you so that all you have to do is focus on getting the right data, testing it out in your scenarios, improving it over time. Um, that's kind of our core goal here is we should take kind of that knowledge, build it in for you. Uh, another kind of neat thing that we have here in the custom vision uh, service is the idea of domains. So uh, you can see here on the left, we have domains general, food, landmarks, retail, and adult. What's happening there is we have a bunch of different featureizers. So you can think of that as the thing that turns your number into a bunch of picture, uh, sorry, your picture into a bunch of numbers that we then go kind of classify. Um, we have ones that are well optimized for different scenarios. So 
Uh, and these are kind of trained on lots of data that might, you know, like they're actually featureizers that we've used in things like Bing and in other services. Um, but we've taken, you know, millions and millions of images, built featureizers with those images, uh, so that if you have a particular domain, your classifier, our expectation is, will work better. So if you're trying to recognize, you know, food or landmarks or like retail objects, so like shoes and hats and kind of that sort of activity, um, that's super easy to do. And then obviously also adult. So let's run a quick test actually to see how we do here. So I have my classifier. I want to run a quick test. So I'm going to get an image just off the web. Fern leaf. And we, have a, we have a fern at the booth if you come by. I didn't bring it here because I've been carrying it around all week. It feels a little ridiculous. We named it Alfonso. I want a quick test here. And my hope, fingers crossed, is that this should return as fern. Um, so this is kind of simulating an API call. Obviously, like this, like it does an API call for you. Obviously, you can do all this programmatically. So here, very high confidence it's a fern. Next highest confidence is it might be a Japanese snowball. Um, one thing to note here is that this is a multi-label scenario. So even though the demo that I'm showing you, we're only kind of showing one object per image. Uh, this is sort of designed that if you have multiple items per image, we should be able to tag all of the things in your picture. So if you have like a Coke and a Pepsi, or you have like a fern and a rhododendron, like we should be able to recognize that you have multiple objects in that picture. Uh, so you would expect to kind of see a higher probability there. So one, two more things to kind of show you here in our custom vision tool. Um, there's one thing that confuses some people at the get-go, but I promise we built it in there for a reason, which Everybody says. So we're here we're at my newest iteration. So as you can see, we were in iteration 31 previously. I've moved here to my current iteration. And when I see here my results, so I got right fern, 80% probability, Japanese snowball, 31%. That's great. Um, I can actually go and do some filtering. So let's say that I only wanted to see images of Cypress with there were at least like a you know an 18% probability. Like, vanishes out because I've kind of filtered it to only show images that are probably Cypress. Let me switch back to another iteration so that's more obvious. So these are things that we thought were probably Cypresses. Um, I think that that's not a Cypress. So I'd want to go and tag that if I knew what that plant was. That's why we got built the tools, guys. Um, or I can say maybe I only want to see things that are either ferns or Japanese snowball, well, fern and Japanese snowball with high confidence because these are the ones that are getting mixed up as being likely to be both things. So I might say, I know I've seen some things where they got confused, so let me see things where there's at least 14% probability that we think it's both a fern and a Japanese snowball. Um, so this kind of idea of a probability threshold, basically, and this shows up a number of places in the UI, is a way to filter out and say, what do I think, you know, what do you think these images are likely to be? Um, it also is useful here in this performance tab. So if I talk about precision and recall, how many people in the audience are like, I know what that is, that's old hat, don't gotta tell me. Lay and you shot. You've got to raise your hands. I know you know. <laughs> okay, so not as many people. Not so many people. So let's actually talk about what this kind of what these measures mean here. Um, so you can think of precision basically as every time you say it's a fern, what percentage of the time is that correct? So let's say our classifier says I found ten images of ferns, but actually only seven of them were ferns. That would be seventy percent precision because it's only seven out of ten times where we write. You can think of recall as kind of like the opposite of that. So recall is of all the kind of true positives, so like of all of the, you know, of all the actual ferns, what percentage of the time do you actually recognize, oh, this is really a fern? So if I had 15 ferns and you recognize 10 of them, that would be 66% recall. Um, the kind of important note here is this is at your own probability threshold. So you can say, actually, I will consider everything above 40% correct, or maybe I'll consider everything above 96% correct. And so basically this lets you make off a, tra a, tra uh, a trade off between how you want to kind of evaluate precision and recall or like what for your particular application you care about. So obviously like the higher your probability threshold, the worse your recall is likely to be because it's more often the case that you take, you know, let's say I said my probability threshold is 99%, there was a picture of a fern that we only thought was 98% likely to be a fern, that's now wrong even though we said 98%. It's kind of like the, the point at which you're um, saying this is accurate or this is not accurate. 
Um, similarly, you can use your probability threshold to see how are you doing on your existing training data set. So this little kind of like red outline that you see here is what are the images that we think your model would get wrong at a particular probability threshold? So in this case, you know, we know that this is labeled as a Japanese, a Japanese fern. Um, there is, according to our model, a guess that it's less than 90% likely to actually be a Japanese fern. So that's kind of marked as red there. Uh, as kind of that's not, not correct. Um, and so these are all kind of little tools that you can use to kind of debug what's going wrong. Um, so when you're kind of building out a classifier, you know, it often is the case that you've gotten a bunch of images, you're like, wow, these are super representative, these look great, and then it does not actually work the way that you want it to. So all these like little things I've shown you in the UI, they're not just like random settings. Uh, they're the things that you would go do, do if you wanted to actually take your classifier and kind of debug it and figure out like, what is going wrong here? Like, how can I make this better? Um, the general the kind of general tips for improving your classifier, the easiest one is kind of the cheapest. You always want to get more data. You know, we let you start prototyping with 50 images per class or so. Um, if you're not getting the performance you want, add more data. And in particular, add data in classes where you're not performing particularly well. Or if you kind of use some of these filters and realize, oh, like I'm confusing these two classes. Um, or, you know, every time my daisy versus roses classifier sees a white rose, it says it's a daisy, you need more white roses. Um, but kind of using these little visual cues will help you sort of figure out what might be happening, how can I kind of debug my classifier and figure out how to improve it. Because as much kind of magic as we've tried to build into it, there's still places where like ultimately you will probably need to find more data. And so all these little tools we've shown you, everything here is just kind of a way to figure out like what might be going wrong, how can I make this better. Um, so 10 minutes to start and then you know, X more minutes to improve as you kind of improve your classifier. Um, one kind of neat thing here is that while I've been showing you mostly a website, you don't actually have to use the website for anything. Every single API that we use to build this website is published. Um, so you can build you know, your own version of the custom vision service website, um, or more realistically, kind of build these things into your own application. So for example, if you want to let users you know, submit labels to you, you know, maybe in an unmoderated fashion, which I would not suggest, you actually could do that uh, using the APIs. You can create projects, you can name them, you can do every single thing that powers this website, all those APIs are public. Um, so you can actually kind of build this into your own application. So that's the custom vision service. Before I move on, any questions? Go for it. Yes. Do you have anything that shows you the uh, the output of the feature detectors? We don't. Um, we get at, you're actually the second person to have ever asked that. Um, and so the answer, okay, so the question if you guys didn't hear is you want to know like, can we actually just kind of see the output of the featureizers ourselves? Uh, we have, it's not a very common request. I usually tell people to take a look. Um, you know, Microsoft now, I think, uh, Microsoft R server now has kind of a, a tool for doing that. Um, and then yesterday there was this Azure AI batch learning tool, which I think also lets you do something relatively similar. But we don't have a tool for just like submit an image and get features back. Um, I would love to hear why you want it after this talk or by now. Uh, it's just for false positives to see what your network is actually focusing on to see if you can correct it. So like color and background or something to that effect. Got it. Yeah. So we don't kind of do that today. Um, I think there's always kind of a trade-off between making a tool kind of very simple to use and very straightforward or kind of adding layers of complexity. And this is sort of like what I think of as kind of the bounds of like too complicated to make sense. Um, like we like tried to like not go over that bound. Um, so we haven't added that today. Um, but since we're person number two, to ask this question. I will noodle on it. Thanks. Yes? Is there a way to, there a way to add uh, metadata? So like you're uh, classifying a Coke can, uh, and there's several different types of Coke. Can you kind of merge machine language and, and pull it's a Coke Zero versus just a Coca-Cola can? No, so today, so the question kind of was about the ability to add metadata um, or kind of recognize new classes automatically. I'm going to treat those as two different questions. Um, so in terms of kind of like adding additional notes, not really. Um, you know, kind of you're just creating classes. And the question about like, can we kind of automatically identify classes? So we don't do any kind of clustering today. Um, so it really is like the classes that you go and build. Um, so if you wanted to recognize Coke Zero versus Diet Coke, you would have to actually build out those two distinct classes. Um, yeah. Go for it. Then do you say that we can add our own custom domains or 
so we don't we don't let you add custom domains today. So you can build your obviously your own custom classes, uh, but the domains are fixed. Um, the general purpose domain works for almost everything. Um, I mean, like tremendously well. Uh, you know, it's been trained on like a very 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 diverse set of images. So anything that's kind of like an object or a thing in the world, um, it will do extremely well on. Um, in fact, I basically never end up using the custom domains. Um, it has been the case we've had some partners that have used it where they have like it's exactly a food scenario and then it works much better. But like for almost every problem that I encounter, the general domain is so good that I don't even have to worry about it. That is a really good question. So the question is about offline mode. Um, so this is one of the core goals that our team had. Uh, we didn't land it for build, um, but letting people kind of export models is something that we would like to do. I don't have a time frame, so please don't be the next person that asks me when. Um, but it's something that we are definitely thinking about how to let you do things offline. And I know that you know yesterday in Satya's demos, there was a lot of conversation about machine learning on the edge and how to enable that. Um, it's something we want to do. It's something we're going to do. We haven't done it yet. Building software is hard, folks. Uh, any other questions? Yes? So if I upload pictures for the train, who, do you guys own the copyright to those pictures? Or can I keep proprietary information separate from the rest of the world? So right now in private preview, we're operating under the standard Microsoft Cognitive Services terms, uh, which let images that are sent for evaluation be used, and I'm not a lawyer, but for service improvements. Um, you know, in a recorded setting, I can't say like where there might be movement on that, um, but definitely like we hear you on this one. Um, so we hear you on this one. <laughs> All right. Uh, if I have a widget that can appear in a thousand different colors, can the system recognize that it's that widget regardless of color? Can I change the size aspect of the object? So if you had a widget that was a thousand different colors, um, I would encourage you to, like, first of all, in that class, like, have many, many different colors, variety styles of widgets. Um, but yes, like, ideally, the expectation would be yes, that if you provided sufficiently diverse training data set, but not every single color, we would expect or hope, depending on your other classes and other information, that you would be, you know, resilient to that. Um, one kind of similar note while we're talking about that, one thing that this can't do is do defect detection. So we get asked that question a lot. Um, the methods that we use are obviously really, really robust to subtle differences. That's why we can let you have like 30 to 50 images per class um, and so be able to recognize these objects. The trade-off is that there isn't defect detection. So you can't say like, you know, I've given you six photos of this like silicon chip. The seventh one looks a little off. Tell us that. So and a follow-up question to his on the widget and the colors. If you actually wanted to identify the widget and you wanted to identify the color, You'd have to make a class per color. So the question was, if you want to recognize the widget and the color, what would you do? You'd make a class for each widget color. All right, and then we'll make this the last question, and then we have more time at the end. We'll do more questions. Excellent. Um, so the two questions, the first question, I'm not sure I understood, you wanted to ask about, what about keys? No, hierarchy. Oh, hierarchies. Yeah. yeah, so we don't have hierarchies today, we've talked about it, I don't know. Um, I think we just like haven't made a call there. Uh, I think Lane, you shower smiling here, but uh, TBD. And uh, the second question was on limits. So it's in private, sorry, public preview and it's free, so there are some limitations now. There is a contact us tool in here, so if you are trying to do something really, really neat for your company, please reach out. Um, you know, we're limiting now. Uh, there are per user and per project limits. You can see them in the settings page. Um, it's a free thing. So that's, you know, how it works while it's free. All right, I said last question, but you can really be the last, last question as long as it's easy. So the question was, can you do custom like sentiment analysis on text or custom stuff on text? So this is a tool solely for computer vision, so it only takes pictures. Um, we should talk offline about like what are the other tools that Microsoft offers for like kind of text processing. I don't think that there's like an API that's like custom text analysis other than Lewis, but that's really more like entity and intent detection. Um, but you know there are some not like 
out of the box things you can use to train glass fires. All right, I'm going to move on. We will leave some time at the end for questions, but I am being slow. Cognitive toolkit. Um, so, how many people in the room have heard of cognitive toolkit? That's oh, beautiful. Um, so, some of the problems we talked about today are super easy to solve with you know emotion API, face API, computer vision API, and now with the newly unlocked custom vision API. There's a lot of things that you can do, which are super super cool. There are also classes of problems that you you know we don't have like an out of the box API for today. Uh, for that, Microsoft has uh, Microsoft Cognitive Toolkit, which is a deep, which is a library for deep neural networks. Very cool. They have focused a lot on scalability, um, being kind of easy to use. Uh, it's designed to be kind of engineer friendly, right? This is like not some kind of an academic tool. It's like a thing for building production systems. Microsoft uses it for all kinds of things internally. Uh, it's been open source for two years. They had a really great release in the fall um, that added a bunch of Python support. Um, very cool stuff. We're kind of not going to go in any more detail than to just kind of call out some of the kinds of problems that you would use CNCK for today. So, for example, if you want to do like bounding boxes, so you want to do object detection, where is the image in a picture? CNCK for that. Uh, you want to do image generation, so actually taking a bunch of images and like making new images out of that data, which is super cool. CNCK. Dozens and dozens of other problems. Speech, everything. This is kind of a library to take a look at. Uh, we're not going to go into more detail here because CNCK is big and there's lots to talk about. Um, and I ran over time. But uh, there is a CNCK talk tomorrow. I'm going to say it like 3 p.m. I have it at the end. Uh, you should go to if you want to learn more. Um, next thing, so we've got two very cool tools um, that are more kind of like higher level. So we've shown you a bunch of the building blocks. We've talked about the APIs. We've talked about uh, custom vision. We talked about uSQL. We talked in an ingenerously short way about CNCK. Um, we also have some very neat tools that I think of as kind of two things. One, they're, they're cool tools for actually doing these things. And two, they're great examples of how you can take multiple cognitive services and pull them together. Uh, one of these tools is Content Moderator. Um, so this is a whole suite of tools for when you have a website that, generate, that has user-generated content um, and you want to make sure that that content, the images and the text, uh, are kind of appropriate. Um, so it can do. It's, a, it's kind of a whole tool and interface for being able to have your content moderation team automatically using the uh, computer vision API, the face API, the text analytics API, be able to kind of determine the appropriateness of images. Very, very cool stuff. Uh, your content moderation team do not have to be programmers. So there's no like, like you as kind of your team's developers. At most, you'll probably have to like sign them up for Azure so they can get like API keys. Uh, but after that, very easy to use tool built on top of the cognitive services for enabling what's a really common scenario. Uh, the other kind of brand new one is Video Indexer. Uh, and this one is quite fun. The relative orientation of this monitor to my computer is the mirror image that is in my office, which is like, driving me crazy. Uh, so Video Indexer uh, is a tool um, that is built on top of the cognitive services. And it's something that, you know, when we first came out with the cognitive services, people asked us for this all the time. So what you're able to do is upload videos, like let's say your company's videos, corporate videos, to the tool. And they're automatically indexed using a bunch of the cognitive services. So I'm showing you this today because for anybody who sat in the room and said, I watched Anna do all of these demos, and it turns out that I want to build this thing, I guarantee that probably at least one person in the room was like, I want to build this thing that turned out to actually be this thing. So we'll make your life easier um, and actually have it here. Video indexer is super cool. So let's take a look at what we've got here. First, you're uploading the video in kind of a, a standard video player. Very neat. But you're able to do some cool things. Like it automatically identifies the people in a video. So if I want to find out all the times that Sasha Nadella talked, or Scott, or my delightful teammate Cornelia, who showed up custom vision in the keynote, I can see where she actually appeared in this video. Um, and in this case, you know, we're not these people are people that we kind of have trained to recognize. It'll automatically recognize people. And then you can go in and say, I want to go in and actually, you know, so and so is, is, is the executive of my company. Let me add them in here. So you can kind of train it to recognize people specific to your company. And I can go and say, let me see when Scott Guthrie started talking. Just go to the middle of Scott's talk. Oh, handsome in now. Um, so you can see who's talking. Uh, this one is really neat. You also, what is happening? Oh, this is the video. Jesus. Sorry, guys. <laughs> uh, the next really neat thing is keywords. So we can see what are the things people actually talked about in the keynote and go to those spots. So maybe I am, you know, the Azure function is, is like pretty cool. 
I can go to the part of the talk where Andrea here was actually talking about Azure Functions. Um, and I can zoom through and find every time somebody talked about Azure Functions and run through them. Um, so we're kind of automatically finding what are the keywords in a video and letting you jump to those keywords. And then also kind of sentiment. So as you can see, this was mostly a very positive build. Um, but kind of all this processing is done for you automatically using the cognitive services so you can parse your organization's videos um, and see kind of what is the content, who is in these videos. You're not just uploading you know, tons and tons of videos to the ether that somebody might eventually watch. You're actually making them kind of searchable, easy to understand, um, and helping you kind of get more value out of those videos. So that's Video Indexer. Uh, if you go to videoindexer.ai, that's there. So I have been excited this whole talk because, oh, and the slide, discoverable content, intelligent apps very easily, improves engagement, and all kinds of kind of workflow and automation. Many, many features. If you want to learn more, you can go to their talk. Um, I have been excited for this entire talk. Uh, like, just very excited to actually be able to show this part of it. Um, I didn't even work on this. Uh, but I want to talk to you a little bit about what we have with gesture recognition. So gesture recognition is coming out as Project Mariah, Project Prague, uh, in the Cognitive Services Labs section. So you remember way back when we were talking about Cognitive Services Labs? This is one of the new APIs that was announced at Build. Um, and I'm particularly excited because I have Kafir Carmon here from the team. He's the principal engineering manager for the team. Um, and I'm going to show you a little bit of what it does, and there will be more demos. I'm doing this, the depth camera has a relatively kind of shallow distance, so I'm going to actually show all the gestures kind of in a more visible way and then actually do them for real. Um, can we swap machines to seven? So let's take a look at what I can do with gestures. So I'm going to do this little gesture, which is the start and stop. Started the video. A little bit too hard. Pause it again. One more time. Pause it again. So that already to me is bananas awesome. But what actually makes gesture recognition on uh, Project Prague particularly cool is how tremendously simple this actually is to build into your own applications. Um, so we're going to kind of walk through what a gesture actually is. So Project Prague is a tool for building out your own custom gestures to your application. Um, and it makes this trivially easy to do. So we talk about kind of what a gesture is in this case. Uh, it's a state machine. Uh, and so you have uh, kind of hand pose objects, which is kind of how you're manipulating your fingers, your palm, orientation of your hand, and then movement objects. And so this is just a state machine of hand poses and movements. And in particular, you'll see how I'm going to kind of constrain the possibilities of a gesture based on movements. So we're going to kind of walk through the process of building out the slingshot gesture. Should we do it? Yeah. So we can pinch, back, open. Really easy gesture. Um, but what's going to amaze you is actually how easy it is to do. Uh, so this is composed of uh, two poses um, and one movement, and that's it. So first thing, let's look at these constraints we have here. So it can be left hand or right hand. I'm right handed, so I'm going to start from the right. Uh, we start off with an index and a thumb that are open. Uh, so I'm not kind of in this fist position, uh, but I'm open like this. And in particular, my index and my thumb are not touching. Very easy. That's the whole constraint. Left or right hand, these two fingers are not balled into a fist, and they're not touching. Uh, now I pinch. So once again, left or right hand, I'm facing forward, and the orientation is up. Not like this, but I'm this way. And my thumb and index are opened. My index is above my thumb. Uh, and now my index and my thumb are touching. So that's the pinch. This one is easy. Motion object is moving back. And now not pinching. It's the same pose as before. So no constraint on which hand it has to be. My index and thumb now have to be opened. Uh, so, and they're not touching. That's it. We've just defined this gesture. Very, very trivial. Uh, what's even neater is how trivially and easy it actually is to add to your code. So you can build a new custom gesture in two minutes. Um, it requires no machine learning skills, uh, no computer vision skills, no need for data collection. And the really bananas thing about this is this makes it so much easier than it used to be to do something like this. You know, like back in the day, to like build a gesture into something like Connect, it would take you know, potentially even months of like work to actually do all the work that it took to build a gesture. You can now do it in two minutes, um, thanks to our experts here. So you can actually walk through that code sample. This is like really cool. OK. So you're on. So can you see my hands here, this level? OK. 
So I'm rotating this uh, slide just to show you. Um, this is the core of the code showing um, how to do the rotate gesture. So this is the rotate gesture. I'm doing my finger this way and rotating. <coughs> so as you can see, there's two poses defined here. Uh, first pose, I called it the hold pose. It's this one. And defining a pose is just by adding uh, finger constraints. The first constraint is the finger pose. About the two fingers, the thumb and the index, are open and pointing forwards towards the camera. The second uh, constraint is the distance relation between the index and the thumb, which they are not touching. You can either say touching or not touching at this point of the SDK. Um, this, the third and last one is uh, the placement relation. It specifies that the index and the thumb fingers, the index is above the thumb finger. Okay, so the fingers could be one above the other, one in front of the other, and so on. The second pose, whoops, the second pose, ooh. The second pose is just very similar to the first pose in the first two constraints, but only the last constraint is changed that the index is to the right of the thumb. Okay, so we have two poses. Let's create a gesture from that. A gesture, as Anna said, is a state machine. This is a very simple state machine transitioning from one pose to the second pose. So the first pose, I'm creating a gesture object here. You guys can see that. And um, I'm adding the first pose, the hold pose, and the rotate pose. It's these two objects here. And once the detector detects the hold, and then it detects the rotate gesture, the, detect, the rotate pose, then it triggers the event. Then you write your code here, and that's it. It means that you don't need to do any data collection, no computer vision, no machine learning. Uh, we did all that for you. You only just use descriptive language and to, d to define your gestures. Uh, the rest of the boilerplate code here is um, how to register to the service. This is run 100% locally, except of telemetry data that is going to the cloud. But uh, all the computer graphics, everything is done locally. We're not storing or using any of this imagery. OK, so let's see. A couple of uh, new demos you saw controlling YouTube already. Um, let's see. Well, this is uh, the rotate gesture in PowerPoint and going full screen. Hopefully, that does something. Yeah. OK, so doing the explode gesture, um, which is basically fist, and then all hands is open. So I got a question for you. Yeah. How do I know what's the right gesture? Like, if I, like, you know, I'm using an application, someone has built in gestures, did a bunch of work to do that. How do I know like what gesture is available to me? So these, this is 100% uh, customizable, um, and you re you define your own gestures. You look at your hand, and you define the, uh, any gesture that you want. Um, you're not tied down to a predefined list of gestures or poses. And as a user, can I? Is there a way for me to see what the gestures are in an application? Yes. I'm cheating. You should be asking the questions now. Because I know. Okay. Should we, should we take a look at the the list of potential gestures for PowerPoint? Oh, you want to see so that? So there's some discoverability here. I just want to call this one out, uh, which is, you know, obviously you can build in these gestures, but like, how do your users even know that like, you've done all this magic? Uh, one of the neat things here is as this is running, we can actually see what are the gestures that are available to me. So that explode gesture or that so rotate get, gesture. Yes, you've got this in animation, and you can see exactly um, what you can do. Um, furthermore, we also extended uh, existing UI, so rotating here in PowerPoint, um, you get this cool tooltip as well. Um, doing, adding this tooltip uh, to the developer is zero cost, uh, nearly zero cost. You just need to tell us on which UI element you want us to do the UI tip, and we do all the generation for you. OK, so moving on to this is how our back end looks, the process itself. As you can see, I'm moving my hands pretty fast, and the fingertips are overlaid with these little arrows showing you the direction and exactly uh, where my fingers are. And as you can see from this part, these are the gestures. I'm going to do the mute gesture, which is climbing up. And you can see the detection here. First is the first pose was detection detected, which was the clamp open. And then the second gesture uh, pose was detected, which is the clamp close. And then the gesture was detected. So let's see a few fun things. Um, we, we created this little game. In Unity, we have toolkit support. Uh, we added a toolkit for Unity with gestures nearly drag and drop. 
I win. How long did it take you to add the gestures to this? Excuse me? How long did it take you to add the gestures to this? So gestures, adding the gesture part was the easiest part. It's like two or three minutes coding the gesture, and the game was the hard work. <laughs> okay. And I want to show you a little bit about uh, video overlays that we got. Um, thumbs up, sends this, and peace, guys. Sends them And I think I'm done. So. Yeah, you're done. So let's. Uh, okay. Well, we got to do one more. You're out. So you can see why we're all pretty excited about Project Prague. Now, if you want to play that game, you should come to the Cognitive Services booth in the Hub. We've got running that all day. Um, my high score is really low, so I'm just saying it's a, it's a good opportunity to come out, play it, and even beat it. Um, so yeah, if you go to aka.ms/gestures, uh, you can get links to Project Prague. I expect to see some really awesome things out of this group. I got a few invites here if you guys want oh. to come and get them. Excellent invites here. So kind of to recap, because we are now four minutes over time, and I appreciate you guys staying here for the four extra three, almost four extra minutes. Um, lots of tools, lots of cool stuff. Try out Custom Vision um, Service, which is brands making new and really exciting. For the problems you've got, we've got answers. And then finally, since we didn't have time for questions, I'm going to stick around afterwards, and also I'm going to put up my personal email. I'm on vacation this weekend, so it might take a few days. But if there are any questions you wanted to ask in this session and you didn't get a chance to ask uh, due to time, feel free to email me. Let me know you're at my session. Um, and I will get right to you right away. Thanks for coming. Really appreciate it. Don't forget to evaluate the session um, and tell me what we can do better next time. <laughs>